Welcome Earl Radide to the stage. Earl's going to share the story of his mother-in-law, Irene Gilly, uh, who grew up in Kuwaitan. And um, <clears throat> so let's give him a big round of applause and welcome him to the stage. No? Hi. Um. I'm not much of a storyteller. Um, just thought I'd mention that before you all figured it out on your own. <laughs> uh, Common Ground is a very good name for this story because this isn't an uncommon story. Um, and sadly, neither is its foundation. It's said that war has many fathers but very few children. And the meaning is that the reasons for going to war uh, aren't always the reasons that we go to war. Uh, this war couldn't be avoided. Uh, Britain, France, and Poland had a defense pact. So when Nazi Germany invaded Poland, uh, it was on. There was many um, attempts at diplomacy and avoidance and so on, but, but that was pretty much the last straw, and that was just September 1st, 1939. No one in their wildest dreams could have predicted the horrors and the loss of the next six years. Now, just allow me to make this one disclaimer, uh, like a notice to reader, I guess. Uh, I'm, I'm no expert in history as it per, apl applies to this war. Uh, I married into the family 40 years after the events of this story. Um, <clears throat> now, I researched private and public information uh, as best I could. Uh, many of these uh, things came across firsthand from, uh, from uh, Irene herself. Uh, this is a story about my mother-in-law, Irene Brown. She was born uh, Irene Gilly, she married her first husband, uh, Jack Murphy, so she became Irene Murphy, and uh, he passed away. Uh, she was remarried uh, to Mr. Brown. She became Irene Brown. You may know her uh, or have known her. She was uh, uh, an artist in the area, wonderful lady. And this is a story about her existence during that war. Now, Irene passed away this past summer at the age of 85. Uh, Canada officially declared war September 10th, 1939. And it was largely those of uh, British descent who rushed to join first and support the war effort. My mother-in-law's father, my wife's grandfather, Cecil Gilly, immigrated to Canada from Jersey. Uh, Jersey's an English Channel island. And he joined up right away, as soon as, as soon as it became obvious of what was going on. He came to Canada to work as a miller at the Five Roses Flour Mill uh, in Kuwaitan, which burned down in 1967. He had two brothers-in-law um, married to his wife's sisters uh, who were living elsewhere in Canada. I, I, I can't remember exactly where they were living, um, but... Uh, they joined the army as well very early on. And that resulted in three sisters coming together with their eight children on a tiny little uh, micro subsistence farm in Second West Bay, Kuwaitan. And it was called Slabtown then. And it was called Slabtown because at the turn of the 19th into the 20th century, there was a small uh, or there was a sawmill on the small river that flowed into Mink Bay. And uh, the people living in the neighborhood used to get the slabs from the sawmill through the lumbering process and build their houses and buildings from slabs, and thus it was called Slabtown. Now, in regards to that war, um, quite often what would happen uh, typically is a man would sign up, volunteer, sign up, and get a date in the very near future for basic training, and then he would leave by rail to hopefully return soon. Now, the fortunate ones returned, 
Uh, but rarely was it soon as it pertained to that war. Uh, one by one, three husbands and fathers uh, left their wives and children to ship overseas and then not return for several years. There was uh, Irene's mother, Hannah Gilly, Nee Smith, with her three children, uh, James, Irene, who was my mother-in-law, and the youngest, Gladys. There was her younger sister, Gladys LeDrew, Nee Smith, uh, with her three children, Marilyn, Dennis, and Darcy. And then there was Florence Hooper, uh, the youngest of the three sisters, Nee Smith, uh, with her two children, Fred and Doreen. So there were uh, three sisters, uh, eight first cousins. My mother-in-law's family, the Gillies, lived on that small farm in Second West Bay, Mink Bay, uh, Kuwait. And the other two uh, sisters initially weren't in the area uh, at all. And I, again, I don't know exactly where they were living. Uh, however, when it became obvious that this war uh, was going to be a long and an arduous affair and that the homeland effort was going to take the bulk of our country's resources, um, they were all forced to come together uh, on a farm. The other two were city dwellers. They were all forced to come together on the farm in order to survive and, and basically keep from starving. Uh, the oldest child there was Jim, and he was 10 years old at the start of the war. It was a garden farm, and they had uh, a cow. Of course, it was a Jersey cow, and it, her name was Beauty. Uh, they had the cow for milk, and they had chickens for eggs and they had the garden and they grew enough vegetables over the summer to uh to eat uh, throughout the winter now it it almost sounds romantic in a quaint sort of way um but this area of town had no electricity or, or running water uh, which isn't nearly as painful in july and august as it is in december and january when there's 16 hours of of uh, darkness and temperatures of 30 and 40 below zero uh, there was one more resident uh, as well. The lady's father, Charles Smith, uh, who was bedridden and, and largely invalid, uh, was with them as well, and he needed constant care. In fact, as, as my mother-in-law remembered it and relayed to me, um, much of his care was left to her, to Irene, who fed him hot oatmeal every morning, and she said she, as a child she can distinctly remember it dribbling in his, in his beard, and she had to and she had to uh, clean that away. Now, uh, Charles was the uh, patriarch of the entire West Bay Smith clan. I don't know if he was the first one, I'm sure that one of you could tell me, but I don't know if he was the first one to come to uh, Canada or not, but he would have been born uh, sometime in around 1860-ish. Uh, he died during that war, 1943, he passed on. Um, now, the eight children, who were all first cousins or siblings, they had no idea of how uh, dangerous or, or desperate or precarious uh, their situation was, or how hard the women had to work to keep them warm and fed. Uh, the older ones, they walked the one mile to school as often as they could, and the ladies did their best to provide normalcy uh, in the children's lives and that they did, which would be very difficult. For the children, it was sort of like an adventure, uh, according to Irene. Uh, they were all together, uh, they were all family, they were all pulling on the same rope, so to speak. All, even, even the children, uh, the very small ones, uh, had a job to do. Uh, but I, I, I wonder what it was like for the mothers, Hannah, Gladys, and Florence, because their situation went on for years. They had no idea. There was no end date. They had no idea. of uh, It was winter after winter. Uh, and it didn't end abruptly uh, September 2nd, 1945 either, uh, as did the war. It, it took a year and sometimes more for all of our Canadian troops to be brought home across the Atlantic. Now, during that time, news of what was going on in a war-torn world was sporadic. There was no internet. Uh, no television. They didn't have a radio. Uh, rural areas and the poor, which uh, 
included a, a majority of Canadians at that time, they had no telephone or radio. Uh, sometimes if something went wrong, it could take months for mail to be delivered back and forth between loved ones home and away. Quite often, and this is conjecture on my part, but I think it's fairly accurate, uh, quite often by the time a letter was received at home, the soldier writing it could have died in battle. And that information was on the minds of everyone who was opening a letter. I, I wonder what he's doing. I wonder how he is. I wonder if, if he or she is, is, is still alive. Uh, Allied forces went into the war optimistic that it would be a short ordeal. And those hopes were very quickly dashed. And this I got firsthand from many who lived through uh, that war. Uh, Lorne Green, uh, later made famous uh, by his appearance on Bonanza, was then known as the voice of doom uh, because he was the CBC war correspondent who reported a lot of negative news for our side early in that war. Uh, they had no idea, no real idea of when or if their men would return. They only had hope and prayers. Now, young Irene was just turning eight years old when war broke out, and she was almost 15 when her father finally returned. Uh, what an amazing struggle and ordeal they had being left home alone. Now, Irene saved a letter, and this was very uh, precious to her. She saved a letter uh, that uh, her father wrote to her uh, just before the end of the war. And it's, uh, it's on a, almost like tissue paper. It, it's, it's, it's so light, and there's little instructions. Fold here. They folded it. I guess they called it airmail in those days. But here's a few lines uh, from that letter dated 7-6-45. Dear Irene, I received your most welcome letter a few days ago. I'm glad to know you are all well. I don't know when we will be coming home. We are still in northern Holland but I think we will be leaving soon as they are evacuating the Germans very fast. We are going to a big town called Leuwarden. If you look on a map, you can see just where we are. I'm very busy these days as the quartermaster sergeant is away on leave and I'm all alone to look after the food and clothes. I have to go 50 miles every day to get rations, so I see a lot of Holland, a very pretty country. The people the people are so clean, and they all have very pretty houses. I think I told you about the camera, which I bought for Jim, and will keep it with me until I get home. I've already taken some pictures. Did you and Gladdy get the Dutch shoes I sent? Well, dear Irene, tell Mammy that it will be at least September before we get home. Fred and I are going to put in our application to go home. I've received letters from Jersey, and they're, they're all well, and the food is going there now from England, so I don't have to worry about them now. I cannot go there yet because there's still no passenger service. Well, dear Irene, I must sign off for now. I will expect, be expecting another letter from you soon telling me how you made out with your exams. Give my love to Mammy, Gladdy, and Jim. Lots of love and kisses from Dad. And I suspect that that was a very typical letter uh, because people tended to be quite stoic uh, then. Now, when I was asked to put together this story, I in turn asked if it was just the, uh, just the historical facts being requested or if some additional commentary was requested as well. And I was told, yes, by all means, provide some commentary. Um, I, like you, have uh, spent some time thinking about what it would be like to go through uh, something like that. And the first thing that strikes me in terms of being quite significant is how different things are today. Uh, some circumstances are much better and some circumstances are much worse. Uh, obviously, in terms of technology, there's, there's no comparison. Uh, I'm not sure of how good that is when I look how it's affected ideology and the general worldview of society. Um, it's not been good. 
First of all, just imagine if a war like World War II broke out today that required that number of hand-to-hand and small arms combatants. Just ponder that for a moment. What, what sort of volunteer response would we get today? Don't forget, many of these men signing up were 18, 21, 25 years old. Uh, we live in a society now where 40 is the new 25, and uh, 25 is the new 15 in terms of personal responsibility. We live in a world of, you know, can't somebody else do it? I'm busy. We, we've really lost our way as a society in that respect. Now, I'm not saying that we ought to glorify or idolize war or warriors, because war is always bad. Uh, that one was horrific in terms of loss, uh, both military and civilian on both sides. It was just completely senseless, but, but I mean, our side was just sort of backed into it. Uh, certain actions need to be taken, and I believe they, they took the right one. I'm very thankful that we had men who were men and stepped up to the task because things would be very different uh, today had they not. Another gargantuan differ- difference is our uh, social economic structure. Um, something you may not have thought of is when, when men o- went off to war and left women and children behind, there was no governmental social a- assistance. Uh, neighbors helped neighbors as best they could. Uh, churches were the main source of, uh, of charitable assistance. You either provided for yourself or you did without. Uh, now I know that that sounds uh, brutally austere to our sensitive modern ears. However, it produced generation after generation of folks who had work ethics and, and the ability to do. Now, don't get me wrong, um, benevolence uh, and helping those who can't help themselves is one of the things that has made our Western c- civilization truly great and different from all the others uh, uh, in history. Um, But yesterday's luxuries are becoming the entitlements of the future. I remember specifically asking Irene about their poverty because they had enough to eat but just barely, <laughs> and, and that's where it ended. And I asked her about, her, about their poverty, and she said, we didn't notice because everybody was poor. Uh, you know, this aspect of the war, being home alone, it wasn't rare. It played out in every village, town, uh, city across the country. And I'll bet you that just about everybody in this room had a family member um, personally affected by that war. Our young men went across the ocean to fight a war so that war wouldn't reach our soil. And it didn't. They were successful in that. They died on the beaches of Dieppe and Normandy to preserve, to preserve freedom and a way of life that they held dear. And that they did. They preserved that freedom. The fortunate ones returned and they built a country that we still enjoy today for now. Now some people have asked, Where was God in all this? Oh, he was watching. Couldn't he have intervened? Well, you know what? Those who were left behind would tell you he did. Albert Einstein, who discovered certain laws which made the atomic bomb possible, when he was very old, was asked what he thought regarding the sort of weapons the next world war would be fought with. And his reply was, I don't know. But the one after that will be fought with sticks and stones. That was the Second World War. Thank you very much.